hard to believe that we only have three class periods left, and then uh, we're going to be on uh, summer uh, vacation. It doesn't seem like it's uh, been long enough for a whole year, but uh, we've uh, been here for a whole year. Um, so very excited. Lots of uh, students are coming by and saying their verses and doing very well. Uh, make sure that you take advantage of that time. You have any time before 5 o'clock on uh, Friday. If I'm in my office, it uh, takes five minutes. Just uh, uh, come by and uh, say your verse. Uh, many students are doing uh, very well, and I'll tell you right then and there if uh, you're exempt from the uh, final. So uh, it's in your best interest to uh, work on those uh, um, and to do a good job on that. So in our final week together, we're kind of using these three class periods to kind of put it all together. And what we're going to do today is really uh, this question um, What's the Bible's plan of salvation? So we've looked at all these stories. We've seen the Christocentric metanarrative elegance. We've seen how all these details point to Christ. Well, how does it relate to the Bible's plan of salvation? And we're going to look at that today. On Wednesday, we're going to look at some just practical advice I have uh, for you about well, where do we go from here? How, how do I kind of read through the Old Testament? How do I read through the Bible? And then on Friday, we're really going to step back and look at uh, the entire semester together. Uh, and we're going to see, okay, what, what have we learned? Um, if you have exempted yourself from the final, it would be a, a nice overview where we'll step back and learn and um, if you're not exempted from the final, uh, it'll be a great way to study uh, for that uh, final because we'll actually uh, use the questions to kind of put the pieces together. So that's what we're going to do um, this week in these three lectures. And so today, two ways to have a great name uh, according to the Bible or the Bible's plan of salvation. And so what we're going to look at is this question, how are people saved in the Old Testament? Uh, we've looked at the stories, we've looked at the details, but how is it that people are saved in the Old Testament? And when we look at the whole Bible and ask, well, what exactly is saving faith? When, when it says uh, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. What, what is that? What is saving faith? What is uh, repentance unto life? We've seen that uh, the people who end up in heaven are all people who have massive sin, uh, who have problems, who, who aren't perfect people. So uh, what does it mean to have this uh, repentance uh, unto life? What does it mean to have this saving faith? And how can I know that that's true of me? How can I know that my faith is real, that my repentance uh, is real? How can I know that I'm uh, walking along the path that the Old Testament and New Testament uh, reveal? So that's what we're going to look at today. And I chose as a way to kind of put this talk together, this idea of making a name for yourself or God making your name great. So the Bible is pretty clear that there are two different ways that people go in life. One is to try to make a name for themselves. And when uh, the people are rejecting God's way and they're trying to uh, make their way up to heaven, they're trying to build a, a tower, um, uh, save themselves from the uh, flood, trying to have fellowship with God. They're trying to do it for themselves, making a name for themselves. And that's contrasted with uh, God who says, I will make 
your name great. So there are two different ways here, God making someone's name great or people trying to make their own name great. Uh, there's a coming to God and saying, hey, I'm, I'm not where I should be. Uh, would you do this for me? Or uh, saying, I'm going to try to do it on my own apart from what you have provided. So the two basic ways, that, and this is consistent in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, either God does it or you try to do it on your own. God makes your name great or you try to make your name great on your own. Uh, God provides a way of salvation or you try through your own good works to uh, uh, make your way to God. And it really centers around whether or not you believe this. There are many people in the Old Testament who say, I don't need God to be good. I can be good on my own. I can, I can clean myself up. I can, uh, I can give myself a new heart. I can uh, cut away on my own my heart of stone. I can cleanse myself from my filthinesses and from my idols. There are people who say that, and then the people who are saved say, I can't do that. God, you need to do, I, I want you to do that for me. Two different ways. God does it or you try to do it on your own. The pers person who said, I don't need God to be good, uh, rejected God's provision and ended up killing his own brother. He, in effect, was saying, I don't need God to be good. I can give myself a new heart. I can conquer my own sin nature. I can cut away the filthiness and uh, my idols. But the truth is, he couldn't. And his brother, who was helpless, who was the uh, nothing, nobody, the uh, emptiness, the vanity, but the one who came with uh, what God had provided, he was accepted as righteous and Cain was rejected. And the Bible is saying that's how it always works. There are people who are coming God's way, people who are uh, offering uh the sacrifice that God provided. And then there are another group of people who don't believe that they're that bad off. And there's a hatred uh, because there's a fallen heart there, a stone heart. There's always a hatred toward the people who rely on God. And the result is uh, the people who believe themselves uh, righteous are always going to persecute those who uh, rely on God. Uh, those in the flesh versus those who are coming uh, with God's uh, provision. That's the whole Bible uh, is presenting itself that way. The people who are saved, the people who are with God, uh, if you want to know what people look like in heaven, there are people who uh, are in and of themselves spiritually destitute, who recognize that I'm not good enough to be on my own. I'm not good enough to conquer my own sin nature. I'm not good enough to uh, take away my heart of stone and give myself a heart of flesh. And Jesus said, people like that, those are going to be the kind of people who live in heaven. And the opposite is true. Those people who don't need God to be good, those people who don't need Jesus to die for their sins who don't need uh, a king to uh, keep them from doing what's right in their own eyes, those people aren't going to be in heaven. Those pe aren't going to be with God because they're making a, a great name for themselves versus letting God make their name great. So I think one of the things we really need to understand is exactly what the Bible means when it talks about repentance unto life. 
if there's an area where uh, saving faith and believe in God uh, is misunderstood today, it's it's right here, this repentance unto life. In fact, uh, there are some people in the name of Christianity and the name of evangelicalism who try to teach that the Bible doesn't talk about repentance, uh, that you don't have to repent, you just have to believe. You don't have to turn away from self-rule uh, to God's rule, just re believe some facts and, and you're good to go. Well, James says the demons believe and tremble. There are a lot of people who believe facts about Scripture, but who've never turned from self-rule. And that isn't saving uh, faith to believe in facts. What is repentance unto life? Repentance unto life is believing about yourself that apart from God, you're spiritually dead. How dead? This dead. Uh, that you're um, like original creation, dead, dark, without form, and void under the waters of judgment until God comes and says, let there be light. It's a belief. Uh, what is uh, repentance unto life and saving faith? It's a belief that you've been justly excluded from God's kingdom because uh, sinful, wicked, unholy people can't live with a holy God and so repentance unto life and saving faith, biblical saving faith, is believing, hey, I've been exiled from the presence of God because inherently I'm a sinner. David, when uh, God is beginning to uh, grant him repentance unto life, says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's not saying that the act of uh, sexual intimacy was somehow uh, sin. David's mother had been married forever to David's father. David's the eighth uh, son. It's not saying that the act was sin. It's saying that the moment I was conceived as a little baby, I was conceived as a sinner. Why, why did I sleep with... Uh, Bathsheba, why did I kill Uriah uh, to try to cover it up because I was such a, a spiritual hypocrite? David said the reason I did that is because from the second I came into existence, I was a sinner. Repentance unto life is beginning to realize that about yourself, that it isn't you're a good person, that sometimes you do bad things. It's a realization that inherently you're a bad tree. Inherently, you're a sinner. Uh, inherently, you have this sin pollution problem apart from God. Paul says it this way, you are dead in your trespasses and sins which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now at work in the sons of disobedience. Uh, was having a conversation with my youngest son yesterday and we were talking about how often in the church you get people who have uh, this idea oh you know transgendered people they're they're horrible sinners or uh, homosexuals they're horrible sinners or this that or the other thing pick your sin and the truth is that the same seeds of corruption that leads to all those sins are the exact same seeds of corruption that we inherit, inherit at conception. Uh, it was a delightful uh, moment where my son and I were talking, and uh, I was able to say, look, uh, I'm, I'm not claiming any inherent superiority to anybody in any sin, uh, because we all got the pollution the same way we got it uh, from Adam. None of us are inherently righteous. We're all uh, coming to be saved the same exact way. The Bible promises that the Lord will circumcise your heart. He will cut away uh, those things that are unclean. And ultimately, 
it leads to people who have a hunger for that, who want this righteousness, who want this new heart, uh, people who want God to cut, take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of real, responsive flesh. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Well, how do you get a pure in heart? How do you get pure in heart? Well, uh, God creates it for me. Create for me, O Elohim, a lave tahor, a, a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. You can see uh, this is our uh, translation in Greek. And you can see these are the exact same words. Uh, you can see that these are the exact same words. So how do you get a pure heart? If you have a pure heart, you're, you're blessed. If you have it, well, how do you get it? Well, God has to create it inside of you, just like he created the universe. Be'arashit bara Elohim et hashemayim et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God bara the heavens and the earth. And David is saying, uh, I am such a sinner. I am so spiritually bankrupt that if I'm ever going to walk in your way, you're going to have to come to this dead, dark uh, thing without form and void, and you're going to have to create it inside of me. Uh, the Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen before how that uh, those words uh, put on, uh, those are, uh, the exact words from uh, Genesis uh, 3, where God clothes Adam and Eve when he, uh, he's covering their sin. He clothes them. Uh, he gives them a way out. He makes a, a narrow way for them uh, to make it back to Eden. And Paul is saying, ultimately, we're putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. The meta narrative of Scripture for salvation is the same exact story beginning to end. Uh, it's hinted at in the Old Testament. It's whispered, but then fully revealed uh, in the New. We're to be clothed with the provision that God has provided in us, the provision of the Lord Jesus. So what does the Bible describe as true repentance and true faith? This repentance unto life, in saving faith. What exactly is it? Or another way to say that is what must a person believe or do? What is it that has to be true for you to live with God forever in heaven? That's what we're going to look at today. And if we get some advice from godly teachers in the past, this is how some of those godly teachers have described this true faith, this saving faith. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, he talks about evangelical humiliation. Evangelical humiliation is a sense that a Christian has of his own utter insufficiency. So when uh, Jesus says, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, Edwards is helping us see that's what this idea is talking about, evangelical humiliation, uh, a humbleness before God, a repentance from before God that, hey, I don't have it together inherently. I don't have enough in and of myself to, to live a holy life. I don't have the resolve. I don't have the intellect. I don't have the power. I don't have the DNA. I don't have what it takes to live with God, a despicableness, and I hope as you're memorizing Ezekiel 36, notice that after people get the new heart, what happens in terms of their own estimation of themselves? What does it say? Doesn't it say things like, you'll loathe yourselves? because of your iniquities and because of your abominations. You get the new heart, and what happens when you get the new heart is you realize how utterly 
bankrupt you are before God. Evangelical humiliation is a sense that a Christian has of his own uh, utter insufficiency, despicableness, odiousness, together with, so you've got this, together with an answerable frame of heart. That is where you say, God, you want people to live a holy life. You want people to love other people as they love themselves. That's what I want. That's not where I am, but that's where I want to be. I want to walk in your ways. I want you to be Lord over who I am. I, I don't want you to come take part of my life. I want you to come take over my life. I want you to take away my heart of stone. I want you to give me a heart of flesh. I want you to give me a, a new heart, a responsive heart, a tender heart. I want you to give me a new spirit. I want you to give me your spirit. And the result is you will walk in my ways. And be careful to do uh, all the things I said. You will live in the land that the Lord your God uh, give. That's what I want. So it's a humiliation with this answerable frame of heart. How do you know if you're a believer? Well, do you see some of that true in your life? Do you have an evangelical hu humiliation where you realize your despicableness before God? And is that accompanied with this answerable frame of heart? where you don't want to figure out the least you can do to get to heaven. You want God to do his complete work. You want him to rule and reign. You, you're praying every day, thy kingdom come, rule, reign, you be Lord. Uh, don't come take part, take over. Cleanse every bit of me, utterly make me holy uh, in this work. Edwards, and uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen any of these people lately. Tons of people post uh, uh, TikTok and YouTube about how they've given up uh, evangelical uh, uh, Christianity, and uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, thing on Luther, Luther and satire on YouTube about uh, Tyler, the ex-evangelical who's given up swimming uh, and he's standing in one of those wading pools and he's talking about, oh, I tried swimming and it just didn't work for me and so I'm uh, giving it up. Uh, that, that is so uh, foolish, uh, so unbelievably uh, shallow. There are Christian thinkers who will challenge anyone and Edwards is one of those people. If you want to a book that stood the test of time from one of the greatest thinkers who've ever lived. Get uh, Jonathan Edwards on religious affections. Oh my goodness, talk about somebody who uh, can challenge your thinking for the rest of your life. Edwards is it. This is what he says about legal humiliation. So uh, there's a difference between evangelical humiliation and legal. This is why he says in legal humiliation, men are made sensible that they are little and nothing before the great and terrible God and that they are undone and wholly insufficient to help themselves as wicked men will be on the day of judgment. When people stand before God, there's nobody who's going to say on that day, I don't need God to be good. Everybody's going to say, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm undone. But in legal humiliation, they do not have the answerable frame of heart. They're just convicted of sin, but they don't have a love for holiness. They don't want. They don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, as Jesus said. They just recognize they're sinners, but they don't want God's rule and reign. They do not have an answerable frame of heart, consisting in a dis disposition to abase themselves. Can you hear the Ezekiel thirty-six language there, and to exalt? God alone, Ezekiel 36 talks about, I'm not doing this because of you. I'm doing this 
because of my great name. This disposition is given only in evangelical humiliation by overcoming the heart and changing the inclination by a discovery of God's holy beauty. John Owen says the same thing. Uh, indeed, pressing after forgiveness is the very life and power of evangelical humiliation. John Piper says it this way, Christ did not die to make much of us, but to free us to enjoy and participate in God's making much of God forever. Uh, how do you know if you've got a new heart? Well, does that kind of describe where you are, where you recognize your uh, unworthiness and you want to see God exalted and his holiness and his power? If if that's you, it means Ezekiel 36 is happening inside of you. It means Jeremiah 31 is happening in you. It means that the new covenant, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. If that's describing you, it means that God is at work doing that. God is is uh, uh, welcoming you into uh, into this transformation. And if it's not true of you, uh, Jesus gave away. Ask, seek, and knock. Uh, all who do that, no one's going to be turned away. So to be saved, a person has to repent and believe. These are two sides of the same coin. This is saving faith. This is uh, repentance unto life and saving faith. Two sides of the same coin, the same saving entity. And what is it? It's a turn from self to God, accepting the provision that God has made. If that's true of you, you're saved. If that's not true of you, you're not saved. So what does the Bible say? Well, I've quoted some men, but uh, men uh, and women can be wrong. What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? Well, this is what the Bible says. Uh, now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. So this isn't the gospel of the Presbyterian Church or the Baptist Church or uh, the gospel of Bryan College. No, this is the gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? The time is fulfilled. God's rule is here. What should you do? Repent. Believe. That's what Jesus says is the gospel. Now, I don't know about uh, what your experience is in terms of uh, Christianity. Uh, it may be a little like mine. Uh, I had kind of two um, traditions that I'm very familiar with. One is kind of a neo-Orthodox uh, that says the Bible isn't really true and and Jesus didn't really die for anybody's sins, but we like religious sounding stuff and so uh, we don't really believe all that stuff, but we use Christian words to make you feel good. I grew up in that uh, tradition. I know exactly what it teaches and it doesn't save. The other tradition I grew up uh, in was within fundamentalism. And I went to a Christian school, uh, a very strict uh, school where uh, the young ladies had to wear uh, dresses and they had to be uh, no higher than an inch above their uh, knee and boys had to wear uh, their hair cut short and uh, if you didn't love God, then the school would just punish you into loving God. I, I grew up in that uh, tradition. I know what it's like. And I remember as a little one going to chapel day after day after day, being terrified that I was going to hell. But all anyone ever told me to do was believe. And I believed and I went down the aisle, and, and if they wanted me to do something else, I did that too. But no one ever told me that I had to repent of my sins. No one ever told me that when I was 
when I came to Christ, that what I was doing was handing over the keys to my life to a Lord, a Savior. No one ever told me that. So I tried to uh, do enough to be okay with God by just believing certain facts, and I was never saved. And the reason I wasn't saved is because in presenting the gospel, they were presenting half the gospel. They were telling me that I could uh, be saved, but I could be saved without handing over control of my life to someone else. And the Bible simply doesn't teach that. The Bible always says, repent and believe. Jesus said it. No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There are two people who can be Lord of your life, you or Jesus, and you get to decide. And if you are Lord, uh, then you can say, well, I don't need Jesus to be good, and you can do whatever you want. And God is going to give you the power uh, to do that. You have the freedom to do that. Live exactly the way uh, you want to live, but don't think that any offer of salvation is made if that's what you want. I've had people before who've come to me and uh, I remember a disturbing conversation I had with a young man uh, years ago and uh, he was living with his girlfriend and he said uh, to me, I don't really believe the Bible is true. He said, but I want to be a minister. Will you write a recommendation uh, to me for seminary? And I told him no. Uh, why wouldn't I write it? Because he wasn't a believer. He, he, he was living. He was the Lord of his life. And you can know all kinds of outward facts. And you can uh, volunteer at churches. You can give money. But you can't be saved with that kind of faith. Jesus said, no, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I wish someone had told me that uh, as a little uh, child. Repentance is a necessary part of saving faith. If someone says you can have saving faith without repentance, they're not giving you the gospel of God. They're giving you a made-up gospel that will not save. So what do Christians believe? What is the, if repentance is that, what, what do I need to believe? Well, Paul says, uh, this is the gospel I preach to you, which you received in which you stand and in which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you lest you believed, quote-unquote, in vain. I deliver to you, as of the first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Um, can you believe in something and get to heaven without believing that it was your sins that Christ died for? And the answer is no. This is the first creed. And the creed says the first and more and most important part is that Christ died for your sins. If you don't believe what happened on the cross was somehow connected to your sins, you aren't saved. But if you, if you do believe that, uh, if you're turning from self-rule to God you, and you believe that what Christ is doing is somehow for your sins, well, then uh, your faith is agreeing. And it isn't just that Christ died for our sins, but somehow that the scriptures are connected to that. In other words, a high view of scripture. So when I grew up in neo-Orthodoxy, uh, one of the things that uh, they didn't believe is that 
it was our sins that uh, maybe there were other reasons Christ died and and maybe it's an example or something else but it isn't for my sins and it isn't according to the scriptures that he was buried that he was raised all these are essential parts of saving faith John uh, records this from Jesus that's why I say to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am so this is uh, Jesus saying unless you believe that I am uh, you will die in your sin so if someone says well I think Jesus was a pretty good man and I think Jesus was a pretty good teacher and I think uh, he, he was a, a great Jew but I don't believe that he's Jehovah and uh, God Almighty incarnate I don't believe that well Jesus says if you don't believe that you'll die in your sins Jesus said to them truly truly I say to you before Abraham was I am and what do they do? They picked up stones. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. And as we come to this, um, there's a terrifying truth in Scripture. And the truth in Scripture is this, that there are many, many, many people who are certain that they're Christians who are going to spend eternity in hell. Terrifying truth. There are many, many, many people certain that they're Christians who will spend eternity in hell. And you say, prove that to me from Scripture. Don't take my word from... This is Jesus. This is what Jesus says. On that day, many people, so this is not a few people. There's going to be a final judgment. Everybody's going to be there. Trillions of people there. Of those trillions of people there, there is going to be a huge group of people who will come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Jesus, I... I uh, spoke up and prophesied. I, I went to churches and I preached your name. I ran Sunday schools. I volunteered in the youth. I gave money. I, I cast out demons in your name. I even performed miracles in your name. These are people who are certain that they're believers. Are you a Christian? Not only am I a Christian, I'm, I'm a leader. And then this is Jesus speaking, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So the picture here is maybe of a preacher or pastor or a deacon or a, a, someone who teaches Sunday school or someone who performs miracles or exorcists or, or all kinds of people that everyone looks at their life and says, oh, that's a believer, but they're a worker of lawlessness. They have, they have this secret life where they're just living uh, completely immoral, happily immoral, and Jesus says, you're not a believer, and not only that, I never knew you. I never knew you. You were, you were never a believer. And how many people is that going to be on that last day of the final judgment? Jesus says millions. Uh, trillions of people there are going to come to the final judgment. And of those trillions of people, many of those people are going to say, I'm certain I'm a believer, and they're going to end up in hell. And I don't know about you, but I come to a passage like that, and it's terrifying. And it should be terrifying. 
he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. There aren't going to be people in heaven who've lived this secret, continual life where uh, there there isn't the work of God, where uh, God begins to cleanse them on earth, uh, where they just live in their secret uh, lives and they have their uh, secret sins, but they said all the right things on the outward and uh, people thought they were okay. None of those people are going to be in heaven. The meta narrative of Scripture is God helping us to see that we have a problem. The meta narrative of Scripture is God dying for our sins. The meta narrative of Scripture is God granting us a new heart. And the meta narrative of Scripture is God beginning to cleanse us from our filthiness and for our idols. So, will there be people in heaven who struggled with sin? Absolutely. Paul can say, a wretched man that I am, who will save me uh, from the body of this death? He can say, the things I want to do, I do not do, but rather the things I do not do, those I do, a wretched man that I am. Plenty of people like that in heaven. In fact, that's the normal Christian life where you realize your problem, you begin to see that filthiness and you long for the holiness and you begin to take the stumbling, faltering first steps in obedience. But what's not the meta narrative of scripture is someone who says, I've got a problem, who says Jesus died for my sins, who says, yeah, God will grant me a, a new heart, but I don't really want it today. I don't want God to mess with my life. I want to I want to live the way I want to live and and I want to sin. Maybe maybe when I get old, maybe I'll repent, but I don't want to do it today. I don't want Jesus to run my life today. That's not saving faith. That's going to be part of these trillions, millions, billions of people who say, "Oh, I'm a Christian." And Jesus says, you're not a Christian. You never were a Christian. I don't, I don't know you. But Jesus does save sinners. This is a trustworthy statement, worthy of all acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the cosmos to save sinners, of whom I'm the very first one. That's opening minds to the scriptures, the forgiveness of sins. Proclaim to everyone. Uh, we're going to skip through these. Uh, I love J.C. Ryle. Uh, J.C. Ryle wrote a book on holiness. It's a, a wonderful book. He has this great qu quote, The length to which some people may go in profession of religion and yet remain unconverted in heart be lost is one of the most awful and soul-searching points in theology. Real Christianity says repent and believe. Turn from self-rule to God's rule. And it says whoever believes, whoever uh, does that, turns self, uh, uh, turns uh, to God's rule, whoever does that has eternal life. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake God made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So, can you know? Can you know for sure whether you're saved? And the answer is yes. Ask, start asking yourself this question. Do you see the work of Ezekiel 36 being done in you? Do you long for God to create that new heart? If you have that longing, 
There's a reason you have it because God's doing this new covenant work. And are you coming like Abel? And remember, his name means the nothing, the emptiness, the vanity. Are you coming to be clothed in the provision that God provides? Are you putting on the Lord Jesus and his righteousness uh, and his forgiveness? And if those are true, then you can know. So the Bible gives every one of us the same advice. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, to make your calling and election sure. For if you practice these qualities, you'll never fail. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God make it so in our lives, and I'll see you on Wednesday.